top one doesn't lie, Marsha. Marsha, the top one doesn't lie.
Jane Heinricher, music director, musician events. Great, great way to begin. Get our energy up. Uh, welcome, everyone, to the first existentialist congregation of Atlanta. We are a spiritual community, philosophically based on existentialist and feminist principles dedicated to human liberation and the protection of the natural world. We make our spiritual home here in the Old Stone Church, which was hand-built by the African-American Antioch East Baptist Church more than 100 years ago. We acknowledge that racial, uh, racial hostility drove those African-Americans from this area, and we honor them and the powerful history of this place. We also acknowledge that in the 1800s, the Muscogee Creek people were driven from this land, and we support justice for all indigenous people. So good to have all of you this morning. Thank you for uh, joining with us. And uh, given the uh, topic for today, our first quote uh, this morning, comes from Corona Scott King. Struggle is a never-ending process. Freedom is never really won. You earn it and win it in every generation. If anyone has a community announcement, if you would write it down, and bring it up to me. There are uh, there's pencil and paper on the table there, so you can write it down and just bring it up, and I will read those a little later on in the service. Do we have any newcomers that would like to stand and give us your name and how you came to be here today? Anyone? I guess that's all those regular folks here today. <laughs> I'm not regular. Well, <laughs> yeah, yeah, regular. Um, how about birthdays and anniversaries? Do we have anyone with a birthday or an anniversary? Come on, guys. Somebody's got to have some. <laughs> Nothing? Oh, okay. Since you walk today, my mother was born. And June 24th is the 15th anniversary of me going on a diet, losing 40 pounds, and keeping it up. <laughs> <laughs> So let's have our next congregational song. This again is going to be in your, uh, no, this isn't in the book. This is a handout that is on the back table. Um, if you haven't already got one, uh, maybe somebody can pass those around. Uh, the title is People Get Ready. and 
um, getting the, all of the necessary pieces together uh, that were required and that culminated, uh, at least culminated for yesterday, um, in the fact that the city of Atlanta uh, has recognized our site, uh, this building and our land as uh, with historic designation and um, the importance yeah. of that uh, cannot be understated. I also want to recognize Dr. Jean for the fact that she uh, had our chorus, our choir, our chorus <laughs> together. Jean uh, chorus join. Baptist Church Choir, and it was a, it was truly um, a wonderful day, and I am appreciate I appreciate all of those who came and helped. There were a lot of people that uh, came and helped to set up, and, and all of the, the uh, behind the scenes kind of activities that go on, and um, it. it it takes a lot of people to uh, have this come together. So thank you, uh, Edie, very much for your leadership and your dedication and your love of this space and this community. Thank you, uh, thank you to Jane for uh, being the one who has re-energized our music, which is such an important part of, of our congregation. So, thank you. Community announcements. Do we have anyone else that has a community announcement? I have one. Um, okay. Uh, and this, this, oh, yes. Edie, can you speak to that? It was recorded by two people. Um, we had a, a couple of photographers and a couple of folks on video cameras, and hopefully something will come out of it that we can share. Oh, great. So, and I do want to mention that um, the plaque for the building that the city formally um, presented to the Old Stone Church in Campbell Park yesterday is on the music stand on the right, and uh, to the left of it is the um, acknowledgement <coughs> of, of Atlanta, um, uh, and how this project is part of the new initiative, African American uh, initiative at the sea, that our dear, dear friend Anthony Knight, you know, is like the ladies that has helped to make this happen. So please. Oh, yes, thank you so much for drawing attention to that. Please, everyone, after the service, please come up and, and see the, the plaque and read what the, what the mayor said. Do we have any idea where the plaque is going to be mounted? Not yet. We're working on it. Okay. <laughs> to, be, to be continued. <laughs> this, this announcement right here, this announcement is one of the most important announcements that we have during the year. This, this that I have in my hand, <laughs> this that I have in my hand is the annual great first existentialist book and bake sale. Uh, Libby and Charlene are the porches behind uh, the book and bake sale. However, it cannot happen. Without your help, I sent out uh, an email, and Sarah has put it in the e-blast, asking for volunteers. I hadn't gotten a single response, but I know that's only because you hadn't gotten around for letting me know. That's right. I'm here. 
I volunteer. <laughs> All right. Um, we actually have a lot of fun um, when when it's the, on the Thursday and the Friday when uh, we receive books, and that's the other thing is please be going through your own books and asking your friends and your family and your coworkers to donate books. I've got to, um, like always, you can't see anything in my car because there's always stuff in my car and there's a bunch of books in my car from people that have um, donated uh, books already and uh, just waiting to bring them in. So please, please, please bring your books, uh, your CDs, uh, any uh, puzzles that you might have for children or adults, uh, and um, we will uh, have all of those on Thursday and Friday as they come in, but what we have to do is we have to sort them and then uh, set up tables and place them on the, on the tables and in categories, and we do have a lot. It, it's, it's a fun uh, uh, time, so Please uh, look at your schedule and see if you can't uh, put us in there, you know, for an hour or two hours or sometime uh, during that. And then also on Saturday, we need just a couple of people uh, to help with the uh, sales uh, in two in one, one or two in the morning and one or two in the afternoon. Uh, I'm going to come and. Uh, fix coffee so we'll have coffee ready for you uh, when you get here and so uh, don't be shy uh, we need every everyone to help in whatever way that you can so and we need customers excuse me we need yeah. customers yeah. oh yes yeah. <laughs> oh, oh let me tell you I've, I've in fact, I'm giving back some of the books that I bought last year so that I can buy more books this year. Um, I mean, you cannot get a better deal um, on a book than what you'll find here at the Book and Bake Sale and a lot of uh, wonderful, wonderful books. So um, please, not only help, but come and be a customer and buy. See, there's so many ways that you can help. <laughs> and the date is? Excuse me? The date. Oh, I apologize for that. The dates are, the, the helping days are uh, Thursday, July the 11th, uh, Friday the 12th. Saturday the 13th is the actual sale. You can go to Sarah's uh, eblast or the email that I sent and it gives you the look the actual times uh, that we need that we need help and if you can't find one of those then uh, let me know and I will be more than happy to provide you with that information no did I leave anything out oh baked goods yes yeah, I think I'm going to bring fudge. Uh, um, if you if you have any um, baked goods um, that are things that that you kind of like that are special, uh, be sure and uh, bring some of those, and we'll uh, and, and put them in little bags so that we can uh, sell those as well. We like. Now's the time that we set aside in our service uh, as a time of silence. It's an opportunity for us to sit quietly uh, with our brothers and sisters to, uh, to pray and meditate in whatever way that and you go inside. And we have candles on either side of the sanctuary if you'd like to light a candle. Um, we'll just be uh, quiet with one another 
for about 30, 35 minutes, and then I'll uh, do the chimes to bring us back into this space. have more power than we know. And then it goes on, be a pebble in the water. Be a pebble in the water and watch and watch the wave, the wave grow and grow and grow and grow. Juneteenth, Emancipation, or 
Independence by Art Jones. Art Jones is originally from Harlem, New York. He has traveled and worked in academia in several Middle Eastern and Far Eastern countries for many years. He has lived in Atlanta for the past 10 years. He is an indie filmmaker whose documentary, Allie's Comeback, has been screened locally and internationally and has received much acclaim from viewers such as Andrew Young, Michael Julian Bond, Sam Macell, and Allie's second wife. Currently, Art is working on another historical documentary, Constructing Whiteness, which examines the relation of relative freedom African Americans experienced before American colonies began to enact racist legislation that restricted their liberty and led to slavery and racial division. He observes, absorbs, and records insights about the world. His presentation today is a reflection of his most recent observations. I'm very happy to welcome Art Jones. When we think of Juneteenth, 
We think of June 19th, 1865, but June 18th, 1865, what I just demonstrated was going on in Galveston, Texas. Galveston, Texas was a port town. It was a gateway, just like Ellis Island was in New York City, for trade of all different kinds, including the trade of human beings. And what I find that is a bit jarring for me is that every Juneteenth, ever since Joe Biden was made an official holiday, I see people getting together for barbecues, and they have picnics, and they have jubilation, and there's a lot of our celebration. Yes, there is on one note, because I think there were a number of Africans who felt extremely jubilant at the time that they heard that they were free. There's a whole other side of this that never really is taken into consideration, that is, but seldom is taken into consideration, that is, what actually happened to create the conditions that Africans and the Americans had to endure for over 250 years that led to their having to be emancipated in the first place. And with that in mind, I want to share something with you that I think very few people ever get taught in high school or any place else in American history, and that is, before this nation was a nation, there was a time, there literally was a time, that had Africans and Europeans who lived together in the communities, and this was at a time in which the term white, as it relates to a group of people, did not exist. And I know a lot of people find it hard to believe, but yes, there was a time in this country where the term white, as it relates to a group of people, had no meaning whatsoever. In fact, the very first people who came to this country in, in, in Virginia, between 1607 and 1681 were referred to by the country that they came from. If you were French, you came to the Virginia colony during that period of time as a Frenchman. If you came as an English, if you came from England, you were known as an Englishman. There are clear documentation that exists that 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 shows that if William Smith bought land from somebody else. It would be William Smith, it would be followed with a comma, and then it would say Englishman, or it would say Dutchman, or it would say Frenchman. And then it would uh, continue with the actual document uh, to indicate what that person bought, because your culture, your ethnicity, was your identifier, not, your, not, the, color, not the color of your skin. That said, can we get a next slide? I want to share with you an image of a gentleman that we should know more about. This guy's name is <clears throat> Lawrence Washington. Anybody know who Lawrence Washington is? Who is it? Was he George Washington's brother? No, he's not. He's, he's, yes and no. He is George Washington's relative, but he's not his brother. Okay. He's George Washington's grandfather. The reason I want you to, uh, to look at that face is because he was a part of a group of people at the, in the House of Burgesses who came together and were part of that, uh, that conspiratorial group that came up with this new concept called white people. And as we go through my presentation, by the time I get to the end, you'll better understand how that happened. But to go to the next slide, I just wanted to make sure that we have some reference. This is the father of this nation. This guy's grandfather was a member of the House of Burgesses. And to be a member of the House of Burgesses in the 15, in the 1600s basically meant that you were calling the shots for the rest of the people who lived there. And they were composed of individuals who were essentially the major landholders. They had the major plantations at that time. They, uh, when you think in terms of the early poor people who came to this, uh, to the Virginia colony, the poor people who came to the Virginia colony were basically working for people like his grandfather. And if we go to the next slide, what I, what, what I, I, what I want to show is that there were Africans who did come as 
indentured service as, as early as 1619. And that 20 plus Africans who did come were not, as many people have been commonly led to believe, uh, not slaves. They were in fact indentured servants. And, and two of them were uh, dispatched to Northampton to work in the Tucker Plantation. And this is really interesting to point out, and at this time in Virginia history, they were following English common law. And if you're following English common law at that time, if someone was a Christian, they could not, under English law, be made into a slave. And so when these Africans came, especially the two, Anthony and Isabel, who actually worked on the Tucker plantations, uh, 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 and they were part of that original 20, they were allowed to convert to Christianity. And as a result, they were allowed to marry. And as a result of that, they had a child. And that child is depicted here as William Tucker. William Tucker was the first freeborn African in the Virginia colony. And that was in 1624. Next slide, please. What you, there are, by the mid-1600s, that in the 1630s and 1640s, you were having communities there, at least two documented communities where those who have completed their indenture were able to create their own communities uh, uh, as free people. These free people who created their own communities were mixed communities. And the census of 1630 in, uh, 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 in a neighboring community to Hampton, Virginia, which was composed primarily of ex uh, indentured servants had 25% of the children that were of mixed background, which indicates very clearly that there were people in the community who came from Africa, who came from Europe, who were actually commingling and in intermarrying and living in the same community in tremendous comfort. This was a situation that had existed throughout the 1600s up until around 1681. And I, I'll get to that in a minute. Let's see the next slide. The first time there's any documentation that I've seen that clearly indicates a shift in terms of how Africans would be treated in the Virginia colony versus Europeans in the Virginia colony takes place in 1640. William, not William Tucker, John Punch, who is an indentured servant on a Virginia plantation, is working with Victor, who is a Dutchman, and James Gregory, who was a Scottishman, the three of them work on the same plantation. And they decide that they have enough of this, that they're ready to check out. And they conspire to escape. They leave the plantation one night under the cloak of darkness, and they run from Virginia to Maryland. By the time they get to, to Maryland, they together are on the run for maybe about a week before they're finally apprehended by trackers that are hired by the General Assembly to go pick them up. The interesting thing is that once they're picked up, they're not necessarily returned straight to the plantation. They go to court. They actually go to the General Assembly, where they actually have a chance to argue their case. And all three of them are essentially found guilty for escaping their bondage. They all have are, are issued penalties of 30 lashes each. And for Victor and James Gregory, they get another four years just added to their indenture. For John Punch, for the very first time in Virginia law, the magistrate sentenced John Punch not to slavery, but to lifelong indenture, because the term slavery was not even used at that time. But in effect, you have the very first legal system that designates an individual to lifelong indenture. Fast forward from that, we have to see the next slide, please. This is a gentleman who became the governor of Virginia in the 1640s. And he was the, the governor of Virginia in 1676. And 1676 is a very special day. Why? Because in 1676, there's a gentleman named Nathaniel Bacon who comes from England to the colony. He's actually a part of the gentry. He is by marriage related to William Barclay. 
but they have differences in terms of how they see the expansion of land beyond the territories that the King, King Charles of uh, the Second of England had agreed to with the Powhatan Indians. And he feels that we can't go past what has already been created. Uh, and Nathaniel Bacon feels very strongly that there should be greater expansion of land beyond that, that scope. While he gets to a place where he, he's conspiring with some other plantation owners who are smaller and, and several indentured servants, and he essentially puts to them that we need to strike out against the Native Americans initially, and, and they do, and, a, and it's, it's, it's not a very proud moment, but you have a an army of about a thousand men, and they are with uh, they are composed of Africans as well as Europeans who essentially have been put in a position where they came over, they were expecting that they were going to get the promised 50 acres of land that uh, for being an indigenous service for five to seven years, <coughs> there was no more land by the late 1600s. And as a result, these people were completing their indenture and they were being released and they had no place to go. And we had a huge number of individuals who had completed their indenture. They were not given the land that was promised. They're irritated, they're angry, they're upset, and very simply, they're mad. And Nathaniel Bacon is able to tap into that frustration. And initially, they attacked the Navy Indians, but they soon turned their actual anger towards Governor Barclay and the House of Burgesses. And they go to Jamestown. And Barclay escapes in time to go up the Chesapeake River before they actually apprehended him. But Nathaniel Bacon and his army actually burned Jamestown to the ground. There is no more Jamestown after these disgruntled, uh, landless, uh, Individuals, as well as those who are small farmers who are being squeezed by Governor Barkley and the House of Burgesses by lowering the price of tobacco that they were receiving and raising taxes on them. Kind of sounds familiar to look at it in today's world. <laughs> um, but the, the Bacon Rebellion kind of stumbles when two months after they burned down Jamestown. Nathaniel Bacon contracts dysentery and he passes. And within a month after of his passing, the king sends a thousand British Tories to the Jamestown colony. And by January of the following year, they crush the rebellion. 23 people are, are, that are, are leaders of the rebellion are captured and hung. And what happens at, is very significant here because the Planter elite recognize that if we allow something like what just happened in terms of Bacon's rebellion <clears throat> to continue or to possibly repeat itself, it threatens one, our profits, and two, our security. You see, Nathaniel Bacon and his army came into Jamestown looking for the members of the House of Burgesses. It's almost the same as if people in the United States today got angry enough to go to Washington, D.C. and look for the members of Congress. And so that the House of Burgesses would ensure that nothing like this should ever happen again to threaten their authority because they were small in number and the masses of farmers were a whole lot larger. And one great way to actually divide this group of people who had, who were of the same class and had so much in common was pretty radical, but very simple at the same time. Skin color. If we can separate the Africans from the Europeans and we create this narrative that Europeans are better than Africans and that Africans are of lower caliber of human being and that there is absolutely nothing wrong with sub subjugating them to the level of being chattel. And we also have these Europeans who 
are now considered something different than the Africans, and we create these uh, uh, patrols that allow us to control both while having these Europeans keep these Africans in check, then we are, and while we're extracting the, the actual labor from both of them and profiting from it, then we have a pretty good deal. So in 1681, for the very first time, the House of Burgesses <coughs> created a law that used the term white for the very first time, stating it related to a group of people. Prior to 1681, there were a number of laws that related to different individuals in the colony, but none that related to a group of people. And from 1681 through to 1723, a whole new series of new laws were created to ultimately create, uh, produce a system where the human race is now divided into a black race and a, and a white race. And actually, they, it got so good to them that they came up with a yellow race, a brown race, and a blue race, and a green race. They could just go at it and deny it. But what was successful was the creation of whiteness, or the creation of white people. There is no place on this planet called white planet. <laughs> I, just thought, I just thought I'd throw that out. There's a Europe, there's a France, there's a Germany, there's a Nigeria, there's a South Africa, there's a China, there's a Japan. Get any map, any atlas. Look as hard as you might. There is no place called white land. There's no place called black land either. They're fabrications. They're the figment of somebody's imagination. And it was created by those who felt threatened by those who were the masses who they were in fact exploiting to make sure that that never ever happened again. Next slide please. We're circling back to Juneteenth and the whole notion of emancipation <coughs> versus someone having real independence. Some things in life people can give you. Somebody can give you a toy, or somebody can give you a, a, even a car, somebody may even give you a house. Uh, there are a number of things that people can, uh, can bestow upon other people in terms of gifts. Something as, as fundamental to our presence on this planet, such as freedom, no one can give you. Either you're born with it, or you take it. And I want to close by quoting the very profound words of Kwame Nkrumah when he says, freedom is not something that one people can bestow upon another as a gift. Yeah. They claim it as their own and none can keep it from them. And on that note, I thank you for your time.
Um, what is our closing song going to be? The closing song is Wende Yaho. And Dominique, one of our members, uh, wanted me to record this so he can learn it and lead it at the service he's doing somewhere. Okay? <laughs> so, our outreach coordinator, Sarah Drew, is going to be recording this. But Dominique's the only one that will see the recording. And he's cool. Okay? <laughs> so, uh, once you get out here, so I don't even see a discount. Okay. So, for those of you that don't know this song, uh, it's, I'll do a call and response thing so you can catch the lyrics. When day young ho. When day. When day
of the building by taking your song books and your pillows and your musical instruments to the back. Marsha, would you all please give me, people get ready, Larry, pass them up here, don't put them in the book. They can get lost. So bring them up to the counter, please. And you can eat. Yes. 